open up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7. We're going right back where we read to the responsive reading. We're going to finish the chapter. My message this morning is entitled, Build Your House Upon a Rock. Build your house upon a rock. We're all building a house in this life. Amen? Whether you know it or not, whether you're cognizant of it or not, you're building a house. Build your house upon a rock. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 24. We've already read several critical verses in this chapter. Verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, that is, in light of everything, entering into the straight gate, about uh, obeying the Lord, uh, about how many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Therefore, in light of all that I've said, whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Did you hear that? What was it founded upon? Are you sure? Okay, it was founded upon a rock, he says. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, when Jesus preached, the Holy Spirit of God anointed it, and people knew these were coming directly from the throne of God. Amen? Not just some intellectual jargon. Christianity has to be more than that to us. A lot of people intellectually know a lot of things about the Scripture, but it's not translating them into them obeying what the Scripture says. Build your house upon a rock. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we're standing in this house this morning, Father, we pray that this church has been built upon the rock, the rock of ages. And Father, I pray that as we study these Scriptures, that we'd uh, introvertedly look into our hearts and introspectively and see whether or not we have indeed built our house upon the rock or upon sand. We ask it in Christ our Savior's name, amen, and you may be seated. Beloved, this sermon, this is the great and famous Sermon on the Mount, the greatest moral and spiritual treatise that has ever been preached to man. I want you to picture this in your mind, if you would, please. Here's these countless thousands of people on this hillside sitting there fixed and focused on what Jesus has to say. Now, it probably took him two hours to do, and you complain when I go 45 minutes. But there he is, preaching away, and right now, beloved, in verses 24 through 27, we can see that Jesus sums up. He concludes this great Sermon on the Mount, the greatest moral and spiritual treatise that has ever been known to man. Even atheists admit that. They say what he said was great, morally speaking. Of course, they don't say spiritually, amen? Now, before our Lord began his ministry, beloved, he was what we know as a tecton. That's the Greek word for means a carpenter. But let me explain to you a little bit what that Greek word really means. It means he was a craftsman. He was an artisan. He was someone who worked in both wood and stone. In other words, he built things like houses and furniture and walls out of these type of materials. So he wasn't just someone who worked with wood. He worked with with wood and stone and, and uh, did what he had to do. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, here, as we read this Sermon on the Mount, he's drawing on his former craft as a carpenter, as a mason who once built these things, and he fittingly uses them as a graphic illustration to drive home the point of why we need to build our house upon the rock and not upon the sand. Listen, beloved, a lot of people have a lot of sand in their life. You know, like you got sand in your shoe, you need to empty it. And they know a lot of things, but they will not bend their will to God. They'll do their own will, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. But why, beloved? Why does he graphically use this as an illustration? 
because he wants to drive home the profound point to his disciples uh, of the type of materials that they need to build their moral and spiritual foundation houses on in the spiritual battle that we're in. So it can endure all of the assaults and attacks and assails from the devil and everything else that's going to happen to us. Listen to me. I've told you we are counterculture. Amen? The, the kingdoms of this world someday will become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ. And Satan reigns over a damned and a defeated domain right now, but he does not know it. And so the kingdom of darkness and the, king, the kingdom of light are in uh, two titans of the universe and loggerheads right now. And there's a real battle going on for our souls, whether people realize it or not. That's what Jesus was trying to drive home the point to so they could see this. And so he uses his uh, 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 career, I guess, so, uh, as a carpenter and a mason. Now, beloved, you have to understand this, that the Bible says most assuredly that attacks are going to come in your life. Satan will attack you. Demons will attack you. They love to get their hooks in your mind, their hooks in your will, the hooks in a lot of different things, don't they? they? Satan is real. The Bible tells us that. So Jesus is showing us something here, how we can defeat the devil in our lives. Because our lives are going to be fraught with problems. I know as a man and I know as a minister, that is indeed true. And the older I get, the more complicated and complex everything seems to, to be. Now listen to me carefully, beloved. The Bible says in Acts 14, 22, that through much tribulation we shall enter into the kingdom of God. Notice what he said. Not to a little bit, not to just a little smidgen of it, but he says through much tribulation shall we enter. Crisis is that Greek word. Many crises are we going to have in our life before we enter into the kingdom of God. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 said this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. It shouldn't be strange. You and I are the objects that Satan utterly hates in this world. We're it. Because we're trying to keep the gospel alive. And way back yonder in the Old Testament, the first prophet, Job, and Job said this in Job 5, 7. He, listen to what he said. He said, man is born under troubles as the sparks fly upward. Now, you've had fires in your backyard, in your little pits or whatever, and you've seen those sparks going up, right? And when they go up, they don't fly away. They usually burn out when they go up into the air, don't they? Well, Job tells us man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying there's no escaping. There's no avoiding. There's no uh, uh, evading the barrage of trials and troubles and tribulations that are sure to come in the Christian's life who is a moral and spiritual stranger, the Bible says, who is just passing through this earth on our way to heaven to live in the eternal kingdom of God. Would you say amen out there? But the question is this. When these powerful storms in life come to you, will the moral and spiritual foundation of your life, will the moral and spiritual footing, will the moral and spiritual framework and underpinning of your life, beloved, now be able to endure it? Will it be able to withstand it and sustain it and survive it? Will it be able to hold it up? I hope everybody here can say amen, and you folks watching by television can say that also. Amen, Pastor. You got me. That's what I am. I've got a good footing. I've got a good base under me right now. Or will you unfortunately find out that that base, that bedrock upon which you built your life on will start to crack and crumble and fall down like a proverbial house of cards when these things come? We'll be shaken like a reed in the wind, as the Bible says. Will you then be sifted like we? We'd be blown away like smoke from a fire. What's going to happen to your foundation then, beloved? Or will you be deeply rooted as a tree or firmly fixed like a post in the ground? Or you've seen rebar as it's stuck in cement or in stone, how firm and secure it is. Years ago, uh, before I went into the military, when I came out, I used to build swimming pools. Of course, when we backfilled in them days, we did it by, we did it by hand. We didn't have the little kabotas that uh, they have now. 
But we'd make sure that those rebars were fixed firmly and set there, beloved, so they would hold the pressure of the pool. God's saying, that's what I want your life to be like, a good rock under you like a rebar. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the outcome totally depends upon the type of moral and spiritual material that you've chosen to build the house of your life on in this world. Now get this, beloved. As we look around, as we look around at everything that's going on in the world today, and we measure it according to the prophetic and precursory signs of Scripture, beloved, you'd have to be a biblical idiot not to see, and I don't know when, but the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ and the day of judgment is fast approaching in this world. We are in the closing hours of history, but I don't know how long God's mercy is. See, that's up to him. But he does tell us to look at these precursory signs. Now, let me, I, I could tell you uh, millions of signs, but let me tell you the two greatest ones. How you can know for sure that Jesus is on the cusp, on the very threshold of taking open the heavens and coming back and rescuing his people. Number one, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Is that happening today? Between the, 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 the social media, between the satellites, between radio, between TV, it's gone through all the world as a witness. Not everybody's going to be converted, but as a witness. You're not going to be able to say, I didn't know that, Lord. He's going to say, you heard it, but you kept building your house on the sand. Anyway, the second one is 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come the apostasia. The falling away first. There will be a great departure from the faith. Not with so much with the lips, beloved, but with the life. Because they didn't build their house upon the rock. So apostasy, uh, the Bible tells us, and the proclamation of the gospel are one of the two primary signs that we have entered in to the last days. Never has a generation been on the top side of this earth that has been able to say, I see that happening in my life. Amen? Amen out there? Okay. In other words, what am I saying to you? I'm saying Jesus is coming. I'm saying Jesus is coming. I'm saying Jesus is coming. What would you say amen out there? Hey, listen to me now. It says in Matthew 21, 21 through 23, Beloved, our Lord warns his disciples that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And he said, And I will profess unto them, Depart from me, ye. I never knew you. So a lot of people are going to be saying when Jesus comes, Lord, Lord, you know I preached about you. I really believed in you. Lord, Lord. And that word Lord there is kurios. It's the covenant keeping name for God. And it's the equivalent of Adonai, the Hebrew word for the covenant-keeping God in the Old Testament. So Jesus is saying, I'm that covenant-keeping God. Only my covenant is the new covenant now. Amen? Would you say amen out there? So Jesus is saying this, that when he comes back again, any professing Christians who claim to have done all of these miraculous things will then be utterly rejected by God and they'll be disowned by him. Just yesterday... We have someone that was very close to us who should know better is shacking up with someone outside of marriage. And they said, but I'm okay because I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Jesus says, you're not okay if you don't obey me. Stop lying to yourself. You see, beloved, a lot of people will be rejected. Many, Jesus said, would be in, in, you know what I'm saying. Why? Why is that true? Because they only heard, did not do what he commanded, and therefore in his sight, they are not his true disciples. They are not his true followers. Now, they may think that they are, but they are not. You know, a lot of people think they're great martial artists, so they get in the ring with someone who can toss them like a salad. A lot of people think that they're great uh, baseball players, so they get out with a real pro who knows what he's doing. Amen. And so we've got to be careful that we don't deceive ourselves because we know who the great deceiver is who transforms himself into a 
of light, doesn't he? And his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness because they're always out to try to deceive us. Now, don't you miss this. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 2, verse 13. For it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but it's the doers of the law who shall be justified in God's sight. Beloved, the Bible says this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, now listen, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He that says, I know you, Jesus, but will not keep his commandments, God says, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. And James, the Lord's half-brother, he was the pastor, the bishop of the mother church, downtown Jerusalem. Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to him because he wanted to get his brother saved. Amen? Like I do when I got saved. I wanted my mama. and I wanted my wife. I want everybody saved. But in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 20, beloved, he says this, even so faith, if it hath not works, that is works of faith, is dead being alone. In other words, beloved, obeying God's commandments are the necessary evidence, expression, and exercise of a true saving faith. In other words, obeying God's commandments are the necessary works of faith that are in the gospel. They are not works of merit that are ex from the gospel. Did you get that? Because there's no merit that you're getting for obeying God's commandments. You're just doing what you should do. Come on and say amen out there. Obeying God's commandments, beloved, are the necessary fruit that must shoot from the root of a true living and dynamic faith if it's ever going to be alive and save you. I'm saying this, beloved, that obeying God's commandments are the necessary preconditions. They are the requirements of God's grace in the gospel that we must meet to be saved. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, he said this, listen. He says, we must have a faith that works or is motivated by love. Would you say amen if you want to be saved? A faith that is motivated, that stems from your deep love of God. I will obey you, Lord, because I love you. I know what you did for me, and this is the least that I can do for you. Come on and say amen out there. So here Jesus poignantly illustrates the point that to build your house upon a rock to be saved, then you must be both a hearer and a what? Doer of his commandments and not just a hearer of them. If you do, you are building your house upon sinking sand. Now I want you to notice these three salient truths. I'm going to try to Stick as close to my notes as I can. As I was going along, right, I just kept writing and writing. I wrote myself right out of the house. But I said, I'm going to stick close to this because I think you got something for him. I want you to look, first of all, at the house builders. The house builders. Look at verses 24 and 26. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now drop down to verse uh, 26. He says, and every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Now, beloved, being a craftsman by trade, Jesus knew the vital importance of building a solid house on a rock solid foundation because it had to be able to endure torrential rains that were constantly falling in Judea. I mean, this was something everybody was completely aware of. And often, beloved, during a downpour, both the land would swiftly be flooded, flooded, and then down the hillside, the water would rush and gush down, and everything that was in its path, whether it was a house, whatever it may be, was carried away like a pile of debris with it. The water just swept it away. All those houses that were built on a rock after everything settled, after the water evaporated, left standing when people looked around was those houses that were built on a firm foundation. That was the only thing there. Now, Jesus is teaching us that these kind of storms will come many times unexpectedly in our lives. They did in Judea. They will in your life. And they will come suddenly, just like the rainstorm and the windstorm that Jesus here is talking about. 
Now, the person that took the easy route and says, you know what, uh, I don't have time for this. I'm just going to put up my shack. I'm just going to build it up right there. I'll say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. Well, Jesus says when the wind comes, the wind comes, that torrential and torrential rain is going to wash you away like a pile of debris. And, beloved, it's going to happen. So Jesus says we need to be mindful, not only of making our temporal houses in this life, but also as we're building our temporal houses, we are in the same token building our moral and spiritual and eternal houses. Would you say amen? Not only for the storms that will come in this life, but the stormy day of crisis of the day of judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says, For it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the crisis. That's the Greek word, the crisis, the judgment. The judgment of the ages. Who enters in, who does not enter in to the kingdom of God? So Jesus is being extremely serious with these people. Remember, these were the sons of Abraham. They thought that they were saved because they were physical descendants of Abraham. They thought they were saved because they had taken the covenant of circumcision with God. And so therefore, ipso facto, they were saved. A lot of Christians think, you know what, because I accepted Jesus and I got baptized, ipso facto, I'm automatically saved forever and ever. That's not true. You've got to have a living and dynamic faith to enter in. Would you say amen? Oh, build your house upon a rock, Jesus says. You see, beloved, you need to be able to build a house that will stand both here and hereafter. Amen? One that will make sure that you'll enter into God's heaven and you'll be able to escape and eschew entering in to his hell because hell is real also. But I want you to notice the contrast, the comparison Jesus draws here between these two different types of builders. In, in verses 24 and 26, I won't read them again for brevity of time, beloved, but Jesus compares and he contrasts these two men and builders as one as being a wise man and the other person as being a foolish man. So what is it that makes them so radically different from each other? First, a wise man, phronomos an heir. That's the Greek phrase. <clears throat> Let me tell you what it means. It means that the wise man is a very thoughtful, intelligent, and prudent type of person. One who sensibly plans his life by judicially counting the moral and spiritual and eternal cost of everything that he says, everything he does here on earth now, because ultimately later in the hereafter, he knows he's going to have to answer to it before God on the day of judgment. So he's always thinking ahead. You see what I'm saying? I know all of you do this. I do it all the time, especially with the ministry. I can't just deal with a problem right now. I'm always looking at the ripple effect because everybody, by the way, has a circle of friends, a circle of influence. So one person's problem becomes their problem, their problem become my problem. <laughs> Ultimately, that's what happens. So the wise man is always looking. He's looking ahead. He's planning ahead. He's making sure he has the mind of the Lord. And the Bible says if you're in Christ, if you're walking with Christ, you have the mind of Christ. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, he's a faithful man, one who uses the supernatural power of God's Spirit and grace right now as he daily labors, as he daily walks to build that moral and spiritual house of his life on the firm foundation of Christ, the rock of ages, in obedience to the commandments revealed in his word and will and ways. In other words, the wise man looks down the corridors of time, beloved, with both foresight, forethought, and knows, and he's fully convinced in his heart that it will be worth all of the suffering and sacrifice, that it'll be worth all of the work, all of the labor, it'll be worth all of the toil, all of the work to build his more and spiritual house on a rock. In other words, as we sing, it will be worth it. When we see Jesus, life trials will seem so small. 50 cents, I'll sing the rest of it to you. It'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. If I didn't believe that, I'd have quit the ministry years ago. I'd have walked away from Christ years ago if I didn't believe it was worth it all when we see Jesus. How about you? 
Now, secondly, and conversely, beloved, in verse 26, we have the foolish man. Moros and air. Now, think about that. You know, we get our English word moron from this Greek word moros. In other words, beloved, it means an impious and heedless one. It means someone who's dull of hearing. He will not hear what the Spirit has to say under the churches. And what Jesus said, isn't it what he said again and again in the book of the Revelation and throughout the Gospels? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath to say unto the churches. Do you have an ear? Are you hearing what the Spirit has to say under the churches? I hope you say amen. But you see, the foolish man is a careless and he's a callous man. The Greek word literally means he's a moral and spiritual buffoon, a blockhead. Now, beloved, this is Jesus talking. He knows what he's talking about, amen? In fact, if you read the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you'll see how that word is used. Why does God call him that? Because the foolish man loves to hear the word of God, but he won't heed God's commandments. Oh, pastor, tell me all about this prophecy. I want to know everything that's going to happen. And you want to get all your doctrinal ducks lined up in a row. Boy, I'm so smart. Boy, I'm so intelligent. I know my I even know the concordance. I know it all. Of course, I don't obey it, but I know it. You see, that's what Jesus is talking about here. Because the Jews at that time, there was only, the Bible says, a remnant. Jesus said, children of Abraham, the children of Israel, be as the sand of the sea. What does he say? Only a remnant of them would be saved. Imagine, beloved, all the oceans, all the beaches throughout the world, and you just reaching down and taking a handful of sand and saying, that's it. That's what Jesus was talking about. He's talking to the God's covenant-keeping people. So we need to pay heed, amen? You see, beloved, therefore, in God's sight, this person is now considered to be stupid and unintelligent. Why? Because he knowingly, he willingly and deliberately decides to ignore and disobey God's word, will, and ways and break his commandments. He knowingly disobeys God's teaching and orders. He knowingly and willingly doesn't listen to the warnings or the threats or counsel that God gives in the Scripture. He won't do it. He's a foolish man. Well, I'm glad I know all about that. Woo! You got to chalk that up so you got a high IQ. I'd rather be a dummy and be screwed on to Jesus. How about you? My kids were growing up. I always said to my wife, I don't care what they do for a living. None. I don't care if they pick up bottles or cans, but I, they will be saved. That they will have some moral and spiritual character. That's what I care about. Everything else God will take care of. Now that they're both millionaires, daddy and mommy can really. <laughs> so we're yours, Kobe and Nikki. <laughs> you need to take care of the old buck. <laughs> you see, beloved, the foolish man, now listen to me, is self-deceived. And he thinks that in the end, both here on this life and hereafter in the next, he can and will surely escape the divine and punitive consequences of his defiant and disobedient disobedient actions of ignoring God. Uh, you know, beloved, I hate it when somebody ignores me. You know what frosts me, honestly? People will come to me as a pastor, and I'll expend, I'll, I'll put a box of time aside or whatever, and then when I want to talk to them, they ignore me. I'm, can I swear? Okay, Lord. Do you ever think that how good it would feel just to be able to just let it loose? <laughs> You know, beloved, it, it amazes me. They'll take all of your time, all of your energy, all of your effort, and then they forget that, and then they ignore you. Well, that's what Jesus is talking about here, amen? You see, beloved, in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, listen to what Solomon said. He says, the way of a fool is wise, or right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. See, the fool thinks this, I'm okay. Everything's hunky-dory. I can just do my thing. I mean, I'm comfortable. I can put my feet up. I got some money in my pocket. I got good clothes. I got a nice house. I got a bank account. I got a 401k. Everything's hunky-dory. See, he's wise in his own eyes. He thinks that he's right in his own eyes. But it's his own eyes. It is in God's eyes. Amen? 
You see, so herein is the radical difference between the wise man and the foolish man who builds the house of his life on two completely different types of foundations, hoping that it will hold up under the stress and pressure of that inevitable coming storm and trial that he's going to experience in his life. So the question is, which one are you? Are you like the wise man or are you like the foolish man? Oh, hear me now. I want you to note the ostensible similarities between the foolish man and the wise man. They're similar in some ways. For example, both the wise man and the foolish man hear God's word and they hear his instructions. They were sitting right there when that Sermon on the Mount was delivered. Amen. Both the wise man and the foolish man have chosen to personally build their moral and spiritual house in this life. Both the wise man and the foolish man were told how vitally important it was to build a strong and sturdy foundation upon which they were to build and construct their houses on. Both of them heard that. They knew that. There was nothing, Christ couldn't have been even clearer than that. And both the wise man and the foolish man know that severe storms in life are most definitely going to beat upon their houses in this life and especially the next life when they stand before the living God in the day of judgment. Amen. But I also want you to note the radical dissimilarities between the wise man and the foolish man. The wise man both hears and he heeds God's building instructions, whereas the foolish man doesn't do that. Beloved, he hears okay. He hears all right, beloved. It's not a matter of him understanding what God said, but he just refuses to do it. You see, his will is stronger than God's will. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done, not my will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And so a foolish man says, My will is more important than God's will. God says, You want to be saved? You want to enter into the kingdom? Then you need to stop thinking like a kingdom kid. Would you say amen? That's being a wise man in my sight. You see, beloved, the foolish man does not believe strongly enough that God would ever reject him. I mean, after all, some of them even got saved. They felt the Holy Spirit in their life at one time. But they think, you know what? I can still do what I want to do. I'm mature right now. I don't have to be as, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? As disciplined as I was when I first got saved. No, you're right. You should be more. I found, beloved, life. the more I discipline myself, the more things I can get done. My wife would tell you, my day is full. I do two things at once all the time. (laughs) I'm shaving this morning and memorizing scripture. I'm praying and eating my Ellie's, what what was it? I call it a Saturday morning morning special. (laughs) But I'm eating it and praying because I've got blocks of time and I've got things that I have to do. But the more discipline you the more you can get done in your life, and the better you'll be at it. And yet people don't have any discipline. That's what amazes me so much. What they need is a good 17 weeks down Paris Island in the core. That's what they need. Have a great attitude adjustment. (laughs) They'll have some discipline in their life. Amen? Amen? Come on now. You see, beloved, but the wise man knows that that's a fool's hope. That he won't enter in, because if he enters in, then God is uh, uh, contradictory said in Scripture. The Bible says in Scripture that God cannot lie. His word is his bond. God cannot lie. You say, but I don't feel that way. God doesn't lie. I don't care how you feel. God doesn't lie. Amen? I've learned never to entrust myself to my feelings because they can vary with the circumstances and situations. Then you look back and you say, how could I have ever felt like that? Why did I wrestle with that in the first place? Now you've grown up a little bit more. I've got more mature in the faith. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, the wise man knows that Jesus said, strive that you may enter in. The wise man knows that you must labor for the meat that endures unto eternal life. These are the very words of Christ himself. The wise man knows that Jesus said you must continue in the faith to grace the doors of God's heaven. The wise man knows that Jesus said this is the work of God, that you continually believe on him and you do those things that he tells you to do if you want to become his disciple. 
You know, let's say uh, you, you were a child and you started playing the piano. And you say, you know what? I, I used to be so good at it, but you get older and you know, the, you, all the responsibilities come and everything's vying for your attention. And uh, you're saying to yourself, you know, I love to play the piano. I was a good piano player. I, I, you're not a good piano player now. You've been out of practice for a long time. You can't look back on your life, man. You've got to look at, you want to be a good piano player? What do you need to do every day? What? What did mom and dad say? Practice makes perfect. And that's true. Do you know, kids, your parents were a genius? <laughs> Practice makes perfect. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is the white man knows that if he believes and does this, then he's definitely going to be assured of entering the God's heaven because he's allowing Christ to work in him with him and through him and lead the way. He's just a follower of Jesus. Would you say amen? Whereas the foolish man says this. Now he may not say this audibly, but in his heart, this is what he's saying. Pastor, you're too strict. No, I'm not, beloved. You'd be better off dealing with Jesus. See, because I'm a sinner like you. I'll let you get away with a lot of stuff. <laughs> you hear me now, beloved. The foolish man says, I don't have to strive to enter into heaven. I don't have to labor. I don't have to do. I don't have to continue if I want to go to heaven. All I have to do is hear and believe what Jesus said. I don't have to do and obey because you see the Bible says we're to believe. You know that Greek word believe means to be living. You believe and behave. That's what it means. Amen. You believe as a Christian. Behave as a what? Be living as a Christian is what he's talking about right here. And so he says, you know what, even if I don't do that, I remember when I got back, I'm still going to go into heaven. I've lived my life the way I wanted to on this earth, done what I wanted to do. I didn't listen to that preacher up there on Carver Road. That's what people call it, that preacher up there on Carver Road. I say, which one is that? There's several churches along the road here. So I'm asking you, beloved, which one are you? Are you the wise man or the foolish man? Are you just a hearer of God's word, will, and ways in your life, or are you a doer of them also? You hear, and do you do? So that's point number one, the house builders. Number two, I want you to see the houses built. Look what he says in verse 24b, and then drop down to verse 26b. 24b, he says, unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now drop down to verse 26 shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Now note these two words that Jesus uses metaphorically here to denote to, to note both the house and the foundation of both the wise man and the foolish man. The wise man builds his foundation. He builds his house, it says, upon a rock. That Greek word is Petra. Remember when Jesus called he Petra, he says, upon this house, Petros, that big, huge old boulder, I will build my house. Now, the, the, uh, uh, what that word really means is this. It means a solid stone. It means a granite. In other words, the wise man knows that beforehand that to build this house is going to be very hard and tedious labor and intense work that will take much time and much effort to do it. Why? Because he knows he has to start chiseling away at it. He's got to chisel away at the foundation stone to get the base and footing firmly settled and rock solid, beloved, so he can securely support those, uh, put those support columns in and all the timbers of his house can be built upon them so it won't rock and shake. And there's earthquakes in the, in the Middle East also, beloved. So why does he do that, beloved? So he knows that when he builds his house, it will be secure. It will be strong and stable and able to withstand and endure all of these powerful and sudden, unpredictable rain and windstorms and floods that may come his way. You see, the wise man, through sight and forethought, has already counted the cost. Isn't that what Jesus tells us to do? You want to be my disciple? I do, Lord. Count the cost. This is what it's going to take for you. You want to be a good piano player? Count the cost. You want to know how to do your computer? What? Count the cost. You want to be an expert on it. Count the cost because it's going to cost you something. 
It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you energy. It's going to cost you effort. It's going to cost you a lot of things. No one, very few of us are born a savant like Tom. Did you get that, Tom? You know what a savant is? That's the kick from the French, right? Savant. Oh, that's savant. Okay. <laughs> very, very few of us are born savants. You know, I remember years ago when I, when I first started taking the drums, Buddy Rich and Joe Morello were my heroes. These men could make those, you don't hit the drums, you play the drums. They could make them sing. In fact, they made a song out of it, sing. And it just, and you know what they said? Anyone can do it if they'll, what? Practice. Because you see, with a drummer, you've got to do four different things at once. Here's your cymbal hand right there. There's your, there's your uh, snare drum you're hitting right here, your hi-hat, and then your drum, your, your kick drum, you're hitting two different beats or three different beats or whatever it may be. So it takes a lot of coordination. But Buddy Rich said, and Joe Morello, who was blind, just about blind, who was one of the greatest drummers I ever saw, very humble, he, he'd go around that kit. <laughs> Every once in a while, he'd go, you know, no emotion. <laughs> he was a great, great drummer. Uh, in fact, he died a few years ago. And my heart broke. But all that to say, beloved, to be a wise man requires you to plan ahead, to count the cost, to do what it is that you need to do in your life, to put the energy and effort in so your house is not wrecked or ruined or demolished when the storms of life hit. And Jesus warns they're going to hit. Would you say Amen. You see, the wise man knows it's not easy, but rather hard. It's difficult to do, but he toughs it out anyways because it's the right and the safe thing to do both here and he ha hereafter. Hey, let me ask you, what does the moral and spiritual foundation and house of your life look, at, look like right now? Is it solid or is it shabby? Beloved, is it stable or unstable? Is it spiritual now look at it. Be honest with yourself. Or is it carnal? Is it worldly? What is the foundation of your house? What does it look like right now before the Lord? Now spiritually speaking, Jesus likens the wise man to those professing followers of his who both hear and do what he commands them to do in his word. Those in the spiritual battle who truly believe who foreknow that there's storms in life and a day of judgment are coming, so they prepare for it now by building the foundation and house of their life or for what's to come later. In other words, they start building on the rock of ages. Amen? Jesus called the great and precious cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. He also called the stumbling stone, meaning whatever you can be converted or condemned depending on what you do with that stumbling stone. Either you'll trip over it and fall on it, and he'll forgive you, or that thing will fall on you and damn you. So he's called through Scripture, the chiefs. That's why when the papa in Rome says, I'm the rock, you know. Peter calls him the chief cornerstone. Peter calls him the precious stone. Peter calls him the, uh, the uh, stumbling stone. He never calls himself that, <laughs> you know. He's the great shepherd. He's the bishop of our souls, Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, beloved, a wise man will build his house on hearing, obeying God's commandments. And especially, he says, you know what? What I really need to do is I need to do his will in life and not mine. The wise man says, I'm going to submit. I'm going to surrender to the authority and lordship of Christ in my life. And to the best of my ability, my proclivity of my heart is going to be bent toward the things of God. And I'm going to try day by day to live a holy, righteous, and godly life before the Lord. Would you say amen out there? The wise man says, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to make Christ the Lord of my life, not me the Lord of my life. That's what the wise man says. Beloved, listen to me. The day you got saved, you gave up all rights to yourself. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, but Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? He says that by God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. A lot of people say, I'll glorify God in my spirit, but beloved, you can't glorify him in your spirit without it thing coming out of your body. Hey, listen to me. In the day of judgment, we'll be either saved or condemned by what we've done in our body. Amen? Because the Bible says all of 
things come out of the heart, don't they? Come the issues of life. Jesus said what? Come where? They come out of your heart. If I fit heart, I will manifest it out of my body and my flesh. So you don't belong to yourself. You have no rights to yourself anymore. And I say you, I mean me too. See, that's what Jesus wants his people to know. And that's why the church was so strong in the first four centuries and, and beloved was able to conquer the, uh, the Roman Empire because they believed that. And instead of like today, you know, yeah, I'll give you a quote, you, know, you know what, everybody else is doing it, so I'll do it, you know, so it doesn't really mean that much. I, I've got to tell you, my wife's right here. As I study the Word of God every day, I say, Elliot, I pray, I pray, I pray that there's elements of God's mercy that I don't know about. Because he's, Jesus is very strong in what he says to people, isn't he? Jesus said, you want to follow me? Yeah, Lord. He said, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? You tell me. Preach the pastor, Joel. What does that mean? Deny yourself daily. He didn't say once in a while. He say, one day at a time. As Confucius said, no more harikata, I'm say. The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first what? Step. One step closer, one step closer, one step closer, one step closer. I write a song out of that. One step closer. <laughs> I can put on the drums. <laughs> okay. One step closer, beloved. You see, what I'm saying to you is this. That's the only kind of rock that's going to be able to save you in that spiritual battle. The only kind of rock that will save you in the spiritual the only kind of rock beloved will secure your eternal destiny in the spiritual battle I'm sure that you will grace the doors of God's heaven and enter into the kingdom of God would you say amen out there so beloved what am I saying I exhort you to build your house upon a rock the rock of daring hearing God's word the rock, rock of daily doing and obeying and living God's word and following God's word and being faithful to God's word our Lord promises us that if you build your house upon a rock like this, beloved, then you are truly a wise man. So what are you? Are you a wise man? Are you a foolish man? Conversely, beloved, let's look at the foolish man whom Jesus calls a stupid moron. Why does he do that? Because he hears the word, he knows the word, but he will not what? He will not do the word. He always tries to take the easy foundation and house. To cut corners. You see, he's always scriptures. I had a friend that I was dealing with one time. Yeah, but Jesus didn't say this. And Jesus, I said, you sound like W.C. Fields. Remember W.C. Fields? He was a comedian years ago. He said, oh, yes, my little chickadee. Nice seeing you. <laughs> yes. W.C. Fields here. And they asked him the day he was dying to give him a Bible. They gave him a Bible, right? And they said, W.C., what are you, what are you doing with the Bible? Oh, yes, yeah, so I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> looking to see if I can find any loopholes here. <laughs> well, unfortunately, there isn't any loopholes. There's plenty of mercy, thank the Lord. But remember, God is the one that sets the boundaries for his mercy. Amen? God is the one that does it, not me. And who does he say he'll be merciful to them? Read it, beloved. In Luke chapter 1, the mer those who fear my name, I will be merciful to. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? This guy builds his house upon the sand, amas. That means on the unstable, sinking, shifting, sifting silt and soil and gravel. And therefore, beloved, it requires very little time, energy, and effort to build this house because it's easy to dig and it's real quick to erect. He warns that there is no middle or neutral ground with him. Jesus said this, beloved, listen to me. He says, you're either with me or you're against me. Didn't he say that? There's no middle ground here. You're either with me or you're against me. Now, a lot of people want to straddle the fence. If you can see there's a wire up here, a lot of people want to go like this here and kind of straddle it, right? Straddle that fence. My beloved, one slip, and I tell you, if it's a fence, you get hurt, <laughs> really hurt. Be like Syria. Syrians used to impale their 
captives. You don't want to do that. You need to declare your allegiance, declare your loyalty. Who is it? You're going to follow. Will you be a wise man or will you be a foolish man? You see, that foolish man, when that strong wind came out of nowhere, Brooklyn, as the scripture says, that nor'easter, immediately, whoosh, the rain came down the hillside, the flood and the current, and the torrential rain washed it and blew it away, and it did not stand. And Jesus said, the foolish man will be just like that. His house will just wash away. You know, the foolish man is in a very dangerous and dangerous uh, position, beloved. Why? Because he hears the instructions of Jesus, the wise master builder. Because he knows the type of material that Jesus, the master builder, told him to use when he built his house. He's not ignorant of this. He knows all this. And beloved, he hears the warnings by Jesus, the master builder, that there are many, many, many storms that are going to come, especially the storm of the day of judgment. Not only that, he hears the exhortations by Jesus, the master builder, that he's to be both a hearer and a doer of the word if he wants to build this strong foundation and house here and hereafter, beloved. So the foolish man listens to what Jesus has to say very intently. He's poignantly aware of what Jesus said. There's no ambiguity here. He knows exactly what Jesus said. His problem is, he thinks he's going to get away with it. See, he thinks that Jesus never says what he means or means what he says. He thinks, beloved, that he's going to escape everything. The foolish man does not believe or really believe, as Jesus said in verse that straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life and few there be that find it. He doesn't believe that. He thinks he's going to build this house like everyone else in the world, enjoy everything the world enjoys like that, and he will still enter into God's heaven in that day. But Jesus said, you lie, you cheat, and your feet stink. That's not true at all. I never taught that anywhere in my word, never did my prophets, nor anything else. Amen? I don't want a part of your heart. I don't want a part of your life. I want what? I want all of it. The Bible never tells us to give Jesus a part of your heart or of, of your life. And so, beloved, the foolish man, now listen to me, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to have to skip a few things here, unless you want me to belabor the point next week. <laughs> but the foolish man, beloved, believes that he can hear the teaching and the preaching, the counsel of God's word, and he does, he hears it time and again year after year, month after month. He listens, he hears, he hears, but he walks out the back door of the church and he never changes. The preacher is just a windbag. Don't you ever say that. <laughs> I know. I am. I'm a windbag. But they never change. They never humble themselves enough to apply it to themselves. Could it be that God is really speaking from behind the pulpit, that sacred old office that he has formulated, that he has called men to? Be? Is it possible? Yes, entirely possible. Amen. You see, beloved, they leave the church unchanged. And they don't listen to what Christ, the master builder, told them to do. You know, the Bible warns in Proverbs 28, 26, he that trusts in his own heart is a fool. And the Bible warns in Proverbs eleven twenty eight, 28, he that trusts in his riches, that is, that his comfortable and prosperous position in life shall fall. But I love what Jeremiah had to say. At this particular time, Israel was living very comfortably. They were living very prosperously. prosperously. And they would say this, when the true prophets came along and told them that God was going to judge them, which he did. He sent them to the Babylonians to take away 586 of the Babylonian captivity. But the false prophets said, God is blessing you. Look at all the riches that you have. Look how comfortable you are right now. Don't listen to those prophets. And so the people said, 
The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. In other words, God's temple's right downtown Jerusalem. God lives there, and he'll never allow anything to happen. Yeah? What happened to Ezekiel? God says, it's Ichabod. Glory has departed from that house. I left it. God can't dwell in temples made with human hands. The Bible says in Acts chapter 7, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost right now. The Old Testament temples, beloved, they always point to Jesus, the ultimate temple. And then he says, ye are the temple of the living God. Would you say amen out there? So there's always type, anti-type, pointing ahead to the Christian. Because we're the temple of the living God. The church is the temple of the living God right now. But Jeremiah said this, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and make his flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. This graphically explains or describes foolish man, doesn't it? I want the treasures. I want heaven. But I don't want to fight the battle. And beloved, I don't like fighting the battle either. I hate confrontation. Been in enough of them, but I hate them. But it is a battle. If you're going to stand for anything, or you fall for everything. Amen? The Bible tells us that we need to work in our lives. To check the foundation house of our life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, Paul said this to the Corinthian Christians. He says, examine yourselves. Prove yourselves. So we need to do that, don't we? We need to examine. See if you are in the faith. The Greek literally says, see if you're still in the faith. Because Paul had led them to the Lord, and they were, he spent 18 months in Corinth, uh, Acts chapter 18 there. He says, prove your own self. Prove it to me. Prove it to you that you're really in the faith. Beloved, let me ask you something. Is your life more conformed to Christ or to the world? Is your life conformed to His holiness, righteousness, and godliness or to the world? Is it conformed to Scripture or the world, beloved? You see, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, beloved, the Bible says, I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove was that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I may not know what God's will is for your life, but I know it's a perfect one, I know that it's a good one, and I know that it's an acceptable. How about you? You know that? You see, beloved, in, uh, the Bible says in 1 John 2.15, this is John, the beloved, lean on Jesus Christ. He says, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world, and the world passes. The Greek said, the verb is, is passing away as I speak. I'm a luster, but he that doeth the will of the Father shall abide forever. Again, is that word, doeth, isn't it? You know what God says to the foolish man? Anything but a lukewarm Laodicean Christian. You know what I said in Revelation 3.16? I said that those type of things, I vomit them, I spew them out of the mouth because they make me sick to my stomach. Because he's sick of their heartlessness. He's sick of their lovelessness. He's sick of their half-hearted commitments to him. And he's sick of their hearing but not doing. So that's the foolish man, beloved. And let me just close quickly. I said that an hour ago, didn't I? <laughs> the house is battered. Beloved, look at verse 25 and 27. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, yes, verses 25 and 27. And the rain descended. And the floods came, and the wind blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And verse 27, the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now the word beat, prospipto, is an athletic term, beloved, that is used for boxes in a prize fight. Now what that word literally means is to vehemently thump to pound, to smack, to whack like two boxes do to one another in a ring which 
hoping to do it hard enough that they're going to what? Knock them out. They're going to knock out their opponent. And so Jesus says, these are the way the storms are going to come. What are they going to do to you? They're going to beat upon you. They're going to attack you. They're going to whack you. They're going to do all of this to you. You see, beloved, Satan is the God of this evil world system, amen? And he's going to strike and pound away at us with all his sins and temptations. He's going to pound away at you with adversities and afflictions and trials and, and tribulations and hardships and difficulties. But worse yet, he's going to pound away at you with seductive sins and pleasures. Entertainment, comfortable. Why? So he can destroy your house? Why? So he can ruin your life? Why? So he can rob your soul. Amen? Now, beloved, notice the fall of this house. He says, he says great, megas. You know, we megasize everything today. It means really big, huge, totally, completely was the fall of it. Protosis autos, meaning terrible, dreadful was the crash, collapse, and the crumbling of it. It was utterly devastated, destroyed, and demolished. Not only now in this life, but ultimately. A wise man, what happens to him? Well, storm came, stood before the throne. God says to him, Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come on in. I'm going to give you my heaven. I'm going to give you my eternal life. I'm going to give you immortality of body. Hey, beloved, we're going to shake this skin like a snake. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to give you residence, or in French, residence. Como se va? <laughs> in the kingdom of God. Amen. But the foolish man is going to miss it all. Believed? Uh-huh. Listen, you know it. Understood? You betcha. Lost? Sadly, yes. Well, let me conclude with this, beloved. Look in verses 28 and 29. And it came to pass when Jesus had these sayings and that Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished at his doctrine. I wonder why, because they thought they could just hear, not do, right? They're shocked. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, no one had ever taught such divine and sublime eternal truths with such divine authority as Jesus Christ had taught these people. You see, the Bible says they were utterly amazed. They were astonished, beloved, at what he said. And now they knew to be his disciple would cost them something. To belong to the Messiah would cost them something. And so, beloved, they'd have to both hear and obey God's word to go to heaven and not just hear it. And this is what uh, they had been doing heretofore. They'd been hearing the prophets, but they'd not been obeying what they had to say. You know, beloved, I can just picture in my mind all these folks leaving the Sermon on the Mount. They're both excited. They're challenged. You see, they must have thought, you know, this Jesus, this holy rabbi from Nazareth is a real amazing guy. He's a dynamic speaker. I mean, he has the best stories you could ever imagine, and he describes them so graphically. You can't miss the point. And a little remnant of them left that Sermon on the Mount, repented of their sins, accepted him as their Savior, and he started building their house upon a rock. But the majority of them said, what? That was great. This guy is dynamic. We got to listen to him. We got to listen to him. I said, listen to him. But we're not going to obey him. We'll listen to him. That's the foolish man. Amen. He does not build his house upon a rock. Beloved, in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, let me close with this. Jesus said this. If any man will come after me, that word man, anthropos, we get anthropology from it, okay? But it, it's in the neuter gender, it's man or woman. If any man or woman will come after me, let him deny himself. There's a lot of things that we want that we know we can't do, amen. Pick up his cross daily and follow 
But then he ended by saying this, He that saveth his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake shall save it. And Matthew says, and find it. So, which are you? A foolish man or wise man? As I look out at all you folks today, I can tell you're the fool, a wise man. <laughs> and that's what we want to be. A wise man before the Lord, building our house upon the rock. Let's go to the throne of grace.